Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Top Spin Tennis podcast. I've got Chuck Tomlin and John Carpenter with Congruent Tennis on the podcast again. We've, we have some interesting topics we're going to talk about today. So uh, it's a privilege to have them. Let's go ahead and dive into the topics. I'm going to start with, with you, John. Uh, one of the topics we're going to discuss is the hierarchy of values. What do you what do you mean by that? How does and what do you mean by that? How can it help the listener and and how does that tie into congruent tennis? Well, when I studied the history of tennis, um, you know things go in cycles. Obviously, in tennis, you know uh, volley game, as Bill Tilden predicted, you know the all court game that he loved to play. And then he said, you know, they had just left the serve and volley game and he brought a different style of play. And he said, this will go round and round and round and each players make adjustments. And I think in instruction today, there's two main factors that we need to be aware of. And of course, um, Chuck Tomlin came up with the value of congruency that we must look for a, you know, you hear some coaches say a better explanation. Well, I mean, I think of this as a higher resolution explanation. And he brought in the philosophy of dual objectives, a little bit along the lines of a dialectic, where uh, you're learning to balance things that may at first glance seem like they're opposing. Uh, we hear racket head speed, for example, is the example I use in uh, chapter three of my upcoming book. Um, there's been a school of coaches who, you know, knew that racket head speed was being overemphasized. And yet you hear this at the highest levels. Over and over, we've had experience with pro players. What do you mean? That's all I've been taught is to accelerate the racket head. But we know that there's an explanation uh, as shown by a study by by James Shaughnessy in 2018, where he discovered that, hey, maybe racket head speed is uh, overrated. Uh, When that article came out, you know, basically an article on the web appeared about Chuck, a certain coach being vindicated. But there was a whole school of coaches who were trying to explain this. You know, and it's as simple as looking at a backboard, this overemphasis on power, you know, you can pound against the backboard and yet it's not accelerating. So there's, we have to be able to explain things like this. And the thing about the internet today in terms of hierarchy of values has to do with the fact that we've had this USTA, USPTA and PTR, and they're all three about to be involved in certification, but yet there's a grassroots movement such that I can find a pilot, you know, a tennis coach. And I think he has picked up uh, um, this line of history and answered some of tennis's most vexing problems. And there's been other great grassroots coaches, you know, some of them I've worked with, the MTM crowd, were contrarian coaches to a large extent. And now other great coaches come along. There's a guy named Racket Flex over in Asia who does great videos, you know, your own work, which is why we... Uh, contacted you originally because you know you had access to high-speed video which we don't have access to and so at some point this decentralization um you know the atp doesn't allow us to examine high-speed video how good is that for growth of the game that you and i can't take a video of a young alcaraz or a sfiantec and and analyze them and we have to do it during a practice under non-optimal conditions you know, and things like that. It's like they have these gatekeepers that control everything. So um, that's what I mean by the fact that the grassroots coaches, I think, are the ones that are providing the innovations, not the establishment coaches, yeah. not the coaches yeah. that are our clients. That's interesting you say that. You know, you guys have produced some outstanding players and, you know, sometimes, you know, you get them to a certain level, right? And then like the USTA can take over and you've seen it probably personally where players, you know, they can, uh, they can lose their feel or their creativity or, you know, they, they actually digress as players when they maybe move up to those next levels. So congruent tennis, right? You guys are really supporting the grassroots model, but also you can take it to a higher level as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I, w- I would say so. I mean, um, you know, and Chuck will talk about that, you know, with his topic, you know, kind of leading into that, the idea that we can't confuse the students. Simplification. If you're going to play by instinct and feel, everything has to match up. And I can tell you, I've watched one player after another. I've ruined, I ruined somebody's serve recently because I went outside a paradigm trying to bring in an old 
paradigm, not realizing that, you know, I would have been better off sticking with the correct simplified paradigm. But I thought I had to go back to a concept like pronation, which we don't even, do we even teach pronation anymore? Well, I mean, not the way that most people think of <laughs> not it. Not the way that most people think of it, but yeah. You know, and then, and then you know, for example, I got a, a girl out there today, couldn't serve three months ago, and now she's acing people left and right, and she's five foot one, and everybody's remarking about what a great serve she has, you know. And uh, So I got to I gotta interrupt you there, because I think we talked about it earlier in the week. So our son, Gianni, eighth grader, 14, he trained with you guys. You taught him your, uh, the serve code is absolutely amazing when people actually get a hold of this information when it gets out there it's powerful and the beauty the thing that i love most about the congruent tennis and the serve code chuck your your methodology is it's so simple right it breaks it down into parts kind of stack but our son played in a he had junior team tennis championships in madison this past weekend and one in one service game he hit uh two aces and two service winners, all first serves, no second serve. I mean, he was just on fire, but it's amazing how the simplicity, how it can be so powerful. And he's an eighth grader playing against, one of the kids was a state qualifier from Wisconsin. So that was pretty cool. Kids, a senior in high school. So it's just kind of neat to see. I mean, the results are there. They, you know, they kind of speak for themselves, but the serve code, I'm a big believer in that methodology. And one, and one thing I'd like you to sort of re reiterate or confirm there is, you know, when you came down to work with us, we didn't do anything that focused on trying to build power, you know, no. and trying to serve harder. You know, what's a big cornerstone of what we do is, is trying to teach, really focus on the fundamentals, drive home the proper path and doing, you know, the, the you know, timing and the path, you know, by folks on the right path of the hand and the in the paths of the body uh, by focusing on that and the, and bringing the timing in without any focus or even talking about power. We probably didn't even mention it uh, in the training, right. but yet no, I the result is the way when you're doing it correctly and the technique is sharp and the timing is flowing, you know, how the, how the power will just flow. And I think that's one reason that's one of the methods where you can tell if your technique is really good, because if your technique, is on point. Uh, if then all you have to do is basically fo focus on timing your shot. Uh, you don't have to, you know, strain into the shots. You don't have to muscle the shots. Uh, it's it's really a lot more about relying on the technique and timing. Is that? Would you guys think is someone like Federer who didn't have the biggest serve, but probably was top five in, in holding serve? At holding serve. Yeah, service points one, you know, he didn't have the biggest serve, but man, as far as like Chuck, you said, you know, the timing, you know, the placement, and then he could also back it up right after, after the return came in play, he could back it up as well. So let me ask you this, how important is, how important is it to have the big serve? You know, is 135, that 140 threshold, is that, is that like the, um, the Holy Grail or no? more 120, 125 with good placement and backing it up? Well, the, the beauty of uh, being able to serve 140 is it makes makes it very easy to serve 125 very consistent and easy throughout a tournament. So it's a little bit like uh, you might think of a car. If you, uh, if you have a car and you have to ride around with your foot always to the floorboard, you're just burning through the gas and, and wearing out the car, right? On the other hand, if you have a little more powerful engine capable of more, you know, which is sort of like having a bigger serve, you're, you're, you're capable of so much more, then you can throttle it back a little bit and, and conserve. But yet, um, I think as long as you're in those 120 numbers, you're, you're right up there, world class, and it allows you to be a little more pinpoint uh, so that you can work the tactical side of things a little bit better, as opposed to even with Roddick, we noticed a lot of times some guys – serve really big a lot of times they're just going for the box so to speak i mean roddick was not what anybody would call a sharpshooter with a serve too often but, but i know yeah grand he, slam he, over a two-week period you're absolutely trying to hit bombs every single time i mean it is a game of attrition so if you're out there doing that that may not be optimal as far as winning grand slams over a two-week period I mean, you could wear out pretty darn quick so maybe that was the beauty of federer right 
he probably could uh, serve 140, but he went at one, 120, 125 and could make that, prolong that. I think you'd really have to be stretching things to say that Federer is not a great server, you know, because he's so effective at holding and, and, he, and he gets plenty of free points. Uh, I don't think he's as good a model as a lot of people think. I think that uh, he could take his up a level. I think there's definitely some things. I think I would attribute more and better just his all-around game and his ability to back it up. I mean, the serve, as long as you don't screw it up, so to speak, uh, is, is going into every point with such a huge advantage that it should you should be able to back that up and, and hold serve quite regularly, and the better you can do that. I mean, look at Nadal. You know, he's never been one of the top – 10 or 15 or even 20 fastest servers on tour, even when he bumped it up at the U S open one year or last year, he still wasn't one of the bigger servers, uh, even of his time frame. but yet he holds with great regularity. He's very hard to break. He um, beat Opelka a couple of nights ago. And straight and, you know, yeah. just yeah. curious, you know, tonight. Um, and these are two of the biggest servers, you know, these are some guys that are huge servers. So uh, having a huge serve is it, I think you just basically got to know, you know, why it's worthwhile. I think the biggest thing about having a huge 135, 145 ability is mostly important because you can back it down. And when you back it down, you can go longer and you can probably be a little more accurate, you know, with, with your placement. Yeah. John, going back to you with the uh, hierarchy of values. So what's probably the most important concept with congruent tennis or your methodology as far as juniors like kids just getting started you know they're just starting to get into the game well like what do you guys what do you value the most at that level these entry level kids you know uh, I, I, I do think the importance of just being able to enjoy uh success at rallying you know um no emphasis on power i mean i've, I've always been intrigued by the fact that that girls you know, I, I joke with Chuck, you know, why do I have 75, 80% girls versus boys? And I think the boys that come in from other coaches are allowed to, and they're told to hit harder and harder and, and that's how they win. And then, you know, I noticed that um, they come in here and they say, what do you mean? I can hit that shot twice as hard. And I said, not if you can't make it eight out of 10 times, it's, it's a useless shot. You know, I, once you get to the higher levels. So I think the idea that power is overrated, I mean, that's a, that's a congruent, thing you know um things like racket head speed which is very controversial and and i use that as an example in the book um i'm not saying that it's not important but until we understand the two forehands theory the concepts of fade and draw and the intention the height of the ball whether it's dropping or rising you're not going to understand the proper role of racket head acceleration so uh this principle of congruency everything must be able to explain everything else you know, how can a player like Fabrice Santoro be 18 number one players in the world? Or like we just mentioned, Nadal, you know, didn't even lose serve against Opelka. Well, that, you know, when you're working with beginners and juniors versus advanced juniors, the priorities are different. Um, you know, P.A. Vale wrote, you know, in 1904 that, you know, you have to teach the scales first, obviously. And that's another concept that uh, Chuck, when he writes his instruction book after my volume one, um, you know, from 1874 to 1926 comes out later this year, um, we're going to define fundamentals. We're going to help the grassroots coaches find congruency in our vocabulary, in our way of teaching, because um, for some reason, we can't get the US uh, TA and the PTR, um, you know, the, whether it's gatekeepers or just institutional resistance, um, you know, we'll have to do it at the grassroots ourselves. I mean, look how the fade and the draw is already coming into tennis vocabulary now. Since Chuck yeah, introduced I love that. Yeah. So. Good, good. Um, anything else you want to add as far as the hierarchy of values? I mean, I know it's there's different layers to this and um, there's a lot more we could discuss, but anything else you want to elaborate on? No, just but if for coaches and parents that want to learn more, we've got a, a site that's got coaches from all over the world. It's exploded in a, a short time. It's been out a couple thousand or a few thousand coaches, uh, congruenttennis.com. And you'll be introduced to these uh, new ways of looking at things in tennis and simplifying and uniting tennis coaching. Yeah. 
that yeah, question how you guys is, classify you you guys have these daggers right so the lift and spin which i'm just a, a big fan of actually i just did a video with uh david ferrer he's receiving a ball deep to his forehand and you can just you can clearly see it how um, he can absorb the ball and gets pretty vertical at the swing path, but the lift and spin is part of my uh, teaching vocabulary now. And uh, it's just a testament to you guys. So appreciate it. So well, I think, I think go it was, ahead, Chuck. Well, I think it was pretty important when we uh, really started centering our coaching around, uh, you know, ideas like lift and spin versus, you know, uh, driving the ball um, and, and with the idea of how that's congruent you know, making the shot congruent with the, uh, you know, lift and spin. If a ball is dropping when it gets to you, if it's already apex, the ball starting to drop, uh, you know, the, you're generally going to have to put some lift on that ball or, or you know, or it's not going to clear the net, right? So understanding that we're going to have to really lift that ball and spin it a lot more in a situation where it's dropping than, say, uh, if the ball's rising and the ball's coming up past your waist, maybe up past your chest. Well, that's a ball that's already has lift. It's already lifting up. So in fact, what you have to do is manage the lift and make sure that you don't add too much more, you know? So if you use like a lift and spin shot on a ball that's already lifting, you know, I think that was a, a really big, important point to make sure that your swing is congruent with the type of ball you're receiving. That's interesting because if you watch that video on Ferrer, right? So he's at the baseline, he got low because the ball's low in his strike zone. Did you guys see the video? I don't know if you had a chance to see it. No, I haven't, I haven't seen it. See it. Yeah. No, okay. Swamped. So anyway, you know what? I'll put a link. I'll put a link to the video below so people can see it. But he's so. Tell me this scenario. This this is the scenario. He's receiving the ball. It's deep. The ball's <laughs> lower in the strike zone. So I'd say it's right around knee level, maybe mid thigh. He the ball is rising. You can see the ball rise. So it's kind of like a short hop. Okay, so it's below his waist. It okay. looks like a lift and spin. It looks like a lift and spin. The racket angle, the racket face is slightly closed. So he's kind of leading with the top edge of the racket. In that scenario, even though the ball's rising, but it's in a lower hit zone, could you still use the hit and the, the lift and spin in that case? You're probably going to be able to use it um, in those situations. Like you said, it's fairly deep. So there's a lot of court to work with, number one. Yeah. Uh, yep. Number two. The idea is he's probably, uh, I, I'd like to see the swing. I look forward to looking at that stroke, but I got a feeling that he probably limits his, uh, it's probably closer to what we refer to as like a power redirect, where it's not a full all out swing. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in other words, it's probably a little bit of a, probably a little bit more than a half volley, but something along the lines of a half, half volley where you, but so, mm -hmm. so we, we would refer to that as a, a short hopping the ball for, uh, more than I really wouldn't. I mean, yes, the ball is rising, but I wouldn't consider that an on the rise scenario. That's right. It's taking, taking it off the short hop with a with a power redirect, and you're putting just enough move on it to sort of get some control of it. You know, right? Just enough work right. the ball to gain some control. It's, yeah. I mean, like, again, without having seen the shot, but I could pretty much anticipate that that's probably the right. Correct. Right. And it's pretty neat because you know it's a no short hop. Can, it's beautiful. It's a great analogy, like a like a short, like a short stop. Now, like, the, and it's sort of cool, cool about this because of the things we know and then because of the things we've isolated and understand. I could, I can be pretty darn accurate when when somebody's describing a situation with telling them what all is congruent with that situation, and then usually if we can pull up the video or whatever, then we find out that most of the time the things that we, you know. We're able to tell we're, we're, we're accurate and true because we you know you just sort of know now one thing i like to mention though these are guidelines that we give and uh one of the real important things is, is to realize is that you know a lot of times we're talking about professionals they will often go outside the guidelines and and pull it off so to speak right so these guidelines are to help you to be more consistent and help you to handle balls that you struggle with in a more simple fashion but do pros do things different at times? Sure. I guarantee you, if you watch a whole match, you'll see these guys break the rules, so to speak, <laughs> a few times and pull it off. But I think what you'll see more often is when they break the rules, is that'll be some of their, a lot of their misses. 
Let me ask. Let me ask you this because, and we'll get to your topic here shortly, Chuck. But there's a teaching method where, and I don't know if it's the Spanish Spanish method that originated out of Spain, but like one of the the tenets is that when you receive the ball, you always want to receive it in your strike zone. So you know, optimal strike zone is it just like waist high, you know, in that area. What do you guys think about that? Like you got to move your feet. So you're receiving the ball in an optimal hitting zone every single time. My thought is tennis is a game of emergencies. Yes, footwork is important, but sometimes you're just not going to be able to receive it in that. What is your thought on, on that? On that? Well, I think you covered, I think, I think you covered it pretty well saying that you're not going to always be able to do it. But I also think they're sort of right that, whatever you consider your optimal strike zones, uh, you're going to want to uh, try to put as many balls there as you can. Just like a, you know, just like a baseball player, he's a high ball hitter, you know, he's in there trying to stay in the box and, and stay with the pitcher long enough to get a pitch pitch that fits into what he likes to hit. Uh, if he can foul off a couple of balls and then get the pitcher to hang up, hang a high ball in there, he can get the look that he wants. Uh, we're sort of the same way in tennis is that we're, you know, we, we can control where we take the, we receive the ball. Like for instance, if the ball is hit, it's rising, you can move in sometimes on like a 45 degree angle or something, cut the ball off and maybe take it on the rise and take it early chest high. If, if that's a good stroke for you and you can create, you're creating this uh, congruent situation of your skills matched up very well with, rising ball being a mid-court attack, shorter ball opportunity, stealing time from your opponent. And uh, you can bring all these things together in a congruent fashion so that they're able to uh, work in your favor. Um, whereas, say, Nadal, who likes to hit a dropping ball, you know, he might take a different path to that ball so that it's dropping. And he still wants it in a strike zone, but he may want it dropping through a strike zone so he can load it up with heavy top spin and make the ball kick, do the different types. So you guys, so you guys would be, you'd be okay with that, like letting the ball drop. Like, yeah, absolutely. If, if it's optimal to buy a little more time, let the ball drop. And then, so you're, you're okay with something like that. Well, team does it, you know, as, as you well know. And well, it's a fine depending on the player. I mean, you know, you got to optimize your contact for, for, the, for your game. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, you take players, like say Medvedev, I don't think it's great when he lets a ball drop because he's much better hitting those high power fades, balls up around his chest, high, shoulder high, and just uh, hitting that, that power drive fade. And uh, so it would, I think it would be a mistake for him to step back and let people, things drop. Um, I think that's one of the mistakes he made down at the Australian Open when he played it all. I think he sat back too deep and let too many balls drop. Got to play the ball's game a little bit, um, and uh, got away from his own strengths. You know, and and style choices are also important. The yeah. Australian uh, Seville, Daria Seville, I think is her name. She's one of the hottest players in the last few tournaments, uh, coming out uh, strong here recently after um, you know all kinds of serious injuries, missing a year or so. And uh, but she said the biggest change she made in her game was rather than play the baseline, she decided to move back so she could see the court more. And so she moved mm. off the baseline and simply moved back farther. And all of a sudden, she's you know having the best year of her career. So um, it's what the players are comfortable with. Now, the cool thing about the congruent tennis model, um, and it's no secret I've named it as the 21st century tennis pioneer, pioneering in, uh, innovation, is that it allows each player to cognitively understand their game better and find out their strengths and weaknesses, because we're trying to fit, I think everybody into a mold and say, Hey, you got to uh, hit every ball on the rise. Well, everybody says if Nadal learned to hit every ball on the rise, he'd be undefeated. I think it's more nuanced than that, but how are you going to argue with a guy like that who loves to play 15 feet behind the baseline on his forehand? Yeah. Yeah, great point. Great point. <clears throat> well, I mean, of course, you, you probably know that I've been asked by John here to write a couple chapters for his history of tennis to bring in some instruction. Uh, okay. It's sort of like a bonus 
sort of bonus material for his his book. Now, I've been working on that for a couple of years now. All right, before we get to M&I, maintenance and improvement, Chuck, share with the audience, uh, you've been asked to contribute to three to three books. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm really excited that the uh, congruent tennis model has got, gotten a couple of invitations, you know, since John and I have been conversing with it over the years. He invited me to write a couple of chapters for his book on the history of U.S. tennis instruction. Um, he's been um, very, uh, I think, very pleased with the uh, Oh yeah, working with the model since he's been here. He's come to Atlanta to, to learn all the nuances and, and work on it and help and help flush out the model, uh, you know, so that we make sure that we cover things thoroughly. And in the meantime, we've had uh, I've gotten two more offers to write uh, featured sections of books for uh, two different authors that have books coming out this year as well. And so I've already written one of them and I'm in process on the other. Uh, so those books should be arriving. So we'll say the congruent tennis models and get some. So get some uh, featured space and a couple of books uh, I, with any luck, three books this year. Uh, and two of the authors, John is one of them, uh, are going to be doing a couple more volumes to these books. So like John's is going to be two volumes, two and three available uh, follow, follow-ups. And one of the authors that, uh, that I've already written, one of it's in process. He's also got uh, I, what I, contributed to with his beginner volume and he's going to do an intermediate and a um, uh, an intermediate and a uh, advanced model a book and uh, the other author is going to do an intermediate and advanced level book uh, and he's already approaching about contributing to those as well so uh, but it looks like we'll get a mention for you know congruent tennis and some of the work we're doing here uh, in three books that should all be out this year Excellent. Excellent. Congratulations. So let's discuss, Chuck, uh, M&I, maintenance and improvement. Share with us a little bit about what that means. Well, I appreciate uh, you asking me to talk about that. It's something that um, I think is probably overlooked, especially, you know, when you're dealing with systems like ours, where we're doing a lot of new stuff and we're really bringing in a lot of innovative and new approaches to things. But in that process, I think it's really important uh, to, to continue to develop our strengths, uh, things that we've already, um, one thing I really realized from working with my own two kids, you know, I have three kids that I train personally, uh, that they all went and played college tennis and everything. One thing I learned over the years is if you start focusing on other things too much, it's amazing what can fall to the wayside. Uh, I think the best example of that is the serve. My oldest son who had probably probably the fastest, maybe one of the toughest serves in the nation when he was 17 years old. I noticed that even him, you know, you thought, you sort of thought you had the serve all locked in. He really, you know, he was really flowing. Maybe it just come from a tournament where he was facing people left and right and dominated the tournament with a strong first place finish or something. And then you come home the next week and all of a sudden serve and sort of come off the rail. One of the things that we learned to do, and I'm real proud of him on this too, because it's not the easiest thing when you're really good at something. It's not so easy to have somebody give you coaching on something you're already maybe the best in the country at. He did a good job of developing a, an attitude of being receptive to that. Uh, it's sort of like a nudge kind of coaching where we just tried to make sure that we went back focused on the fundamentals, the things that had gotten him there. So like if he came off of a really good tournament serving well, instead of just assuming the serve was in place, we automatically just sort of assumed, okay, we just came out of that tournament. We need to go back and tune it up. You know, we need to tighten it back up, tune it back up. Now that didn't mean we went in and rebuilt the serve, but it just went, we went back to the fundamental issues. We made sure that the toss was still in the right place. Like maybe during the tournament, I might have noticed that his toss was starting to wander to the left more throughout the tournament. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it during the tournament, because as long as he's serving well. But at the end of the tournament, especially, especially if it wasn't a, you know, a big problem and it wasn't wandering that much, but at the end of the tournament, I'm going to say, okay, let's get the toss back where it's supposed to be. You know, and maybe we address why it moved. Maybe we had moved it too far to the right. Uh, one of the big things was uh, launching you know, which is like the third section of the serve code there, your launch up to the toss, making sure that we're keeping that launch angle 
uh, right. And the, uh, one of our big parts is to rise and cut, you know, to make sure you're rising up as you cut up on the ball. We just developed this attitude of, of you know, I, I one of the things I think of is like a race car driver when he goes to a new track and he's tuning up his car. And, and even though you got the best driver in the world, you got the best car in the world, but you still got to tune that tune that car to the track and, and to the driver. So we'd go in and, and just make those fine adjustments and stay on top of it. Uh, I feel like the serve really doesn't have a good shelf life. And I think it makes a great example, but I think that's true of all the strokes. You know, like if you go for a couple of weeks and you don't do any volleys, you know, or any slice work or any volley work, and next thing you know, you come out there, kid that might've been three weeks ago, they might've been slicing like a champion or volleying like a champ. But all of a sudden, if you've ignored that work and haven't really stayed on top of it, giving them the reps and maybe a little bit of feedback, maybe their best stroke is not the best stroke anymore. Yeah, yeah. I love, I love the way you guys equate the, your your methodology to just normal life activities, right? How they can relate to like, you know, a race car, things like that. That's, um, I think it's just easier to comprehend and to absorb the methodology. So that's great. <clears throat> What else? What else with maintenance and, improve, and improvement? How else does this relate to congruent tennis and improving as a tennis player? Well, one of the things I mentioned in the book, uh, John's book, with the, the history of U.S. tennis instruction, is that um, I talk about the idea of earning it every time you walk out on the court. And what I mean by that is, you know, I know there's a big tendency because I, I had it. I think you probably have experienced this. Most people who have played, my, they might not have realized what was going on, but if you play really good, let's say you played really good yesterday and you played two or three matches, and you played well with your friends, there's a tendency to come out the next day expecting to play along the lines of how well you were playing yesterday. And I think what we forget is what got us there, why we were playing good that day. Uh, something funny about tennis, you don't just walk out there and pick up where you left off. I think you have to go back and uh, do the work that got you there, you know, like, like the warm up, like the mini tennis, you know, you spend some time in mini tennis and I have specific things that I work on when I'm doing mini ball reception. Uh, I work on the, the movement. I work on picking the types of shots I want to hit based on the ball. I try to focus on really keeping my eye on the ball in the mini tennis. All these are things that are little tune up things so that when you move into hitting full court or the match play, that you, you've sort of laid the groundwork. Um, so you're trying to maintain and maybe even improve a little bit as opposed to just showing up and saying, okay, I was hitting good yesterday. I should hit pretty good today. You know, uh, do the work, earn it. You know, every time you step on the court, get ready to earn it. And uh, one of the examples we use in the book is Lindell, who was sort of semi-famously known. I don't know how many people know about this, but there was tournaments that he would show up before daybreak, you know, still dark and he's going to hit against a wall using his car lights in Cincinnati one year at 5 a.m. in the morning in the dark hitting against the backboard now not only did he do this but he did this when he was already like head and shoulders <laughs> he was you know how Nadal is, uh, is really dominant right now and how Novak has been dominant over the last few years this is a period of time where Lindell was as dominant as Novak and he didn't just say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Lindell. I'm walking out on the court. And I'm, I'm dominating the world. He was out there before the sun even came up, using his headlights, hitting against a wall to, to, to earn it. You know, he knows, and, and I think good players realize at some point that you have to go out there and do the work if you want to have access to your best play. You know, that's, we were talking again earlier in the week and, you talked about just being an absolute machine, right? From the baseline, you just, you gotta, it's just gotta be this mentality where you just don't miss. So if you're a, if we have tennis coaches out there, parents that are listening to this, how do you develop that, that mentality, that this machine, like I'm just going to play, I'm back here and I will not miss like good luck beating me. How do, you, how do you train that? How do you teach that? Is that just something that's built into a kid or it can be trained? Well, I mean, the first part is to recognize it like you're, you're talking about there, to really recognize the importance of that, you know, because um, as these kids get better, 
it's just that tendency like, oh, he's got that, you know, he's got a good forehand, he's got a good backhand. Uh, you know, but, but the, you know, if you watch a lot of these pros when they go to the court, like I was just on the pro, uh, court with one of the pros that I work with, a uh, guy who's ranked about 400 in the world. Um, I was with him down in Naples and he and another pro were hitting, and, you know, they started out hitting down the middle, then they moved over and hit corner to corner. Then they, they stood up, hit down the line with a forehand, hit down the line with a backhand. You know, these are two guys getting out on the court and earning it and getting their game tuned up, lined up, doing the work. And it, it's a mentality first, I think, of recognition of the importance of that, you know, because uh, yeah. if you don't, obviously if you don't see it and recognize it, you, you, don't, you, you don't even know what the goal is, right? I think that if you will spend the time, I think that's one reason the, the ball baskets, you know, have a full of 100, 150 balls got so popular is because if you can just keep feeding that ball, you know, and you can go through a certain sequence, you know, like I think the coach over at Georgia used to say for his ball players, he called it a finish the drill. I know that uh, Robert Lansdorp was really famous for his, his ball drills like that. So being able to, you know, the Spanish, they do the same kind of thing. And it, it, it's looking for a level of execution where realizing the key point is to take a ball put it where it needs to be on the other side. It's not so much, you know, it's not so much a, a trying to set a record with power or a record with spin each time. It's about being able to have a level of accomplishment and be able to repeat that over and over and over to it, to the intended part of the court. Let me ask you this, as far as power and the game, because you guys are, you know, you're big on not getting enamored with the power, because that can be, that's an easy trap to fall into with anybody, right? Pro level, junior level, my level, your level. What would you say as far as the pros, ATP, WTA, as far as efficiency and how, I know it, it depends on the intent, but how hard are they trying to hit every time? Is it, I, you know, is it 90% of their power, 80%? I know a lot of it's intent and the incoming ball and what they're trying to do with it, but Talk about that a little bit. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think this is a good one for me to answer because <laughs> I, I feel like I've done the math on this, you know. In other words, we know what the upper <laughs> limits of what a guy can hit on his forehand. We've seen, you know, as a multitude of guys that have hit between 110 and 125, you know. So if you use a rough number like 120 miles an hour, it's something that they're all capable of, right? They're all, all these top pros are capable of roughly 120 mile an hour forehand if they get the right situation. But as you notice, their average is much closer to 75. So you do the math and you find out they're really only hitting about 70% of their capability. You know, um, I think it's important to realize, you know, because I think a lot of times rec players are out there trying to play at 90. And they may not be trying to hit it 100% every time, but they're probably trying to go more like 90, 95. 85, 95% of their capability, and they wonder why they miss more. You know, now granted, if you're only hitting 70%, you know, 70% of a slower number is pretty darn slow, uh, you know, and you might feel like you're not hitting very hard. But at the same time, I think uh, those percentages do matter. You know, I do think that you probably, you start trying to hit over 80% regularly. Now, you set up a ball where you really get a good look and you got to, and I think it's really actually important that you've been hitting 70%. So if you've been hitting 70, 75%, 80%, and you've been, you've developed a rhythm and now you get a nice sitter, I think you've developed the confidence and you've developed the muscle memory and the muscle neur neuron patterns and everything that you can go ahead and uh, do a heat check and, and see, see what, you know, see what you can get out of that when you've earned the opportunity to, to hit one a little bit harder. So yeah, I've um, got a, I got a junior. I got a junior I worked with, and when I came back from Atlanta with you guys, and I I worked with her, and I I, I gave her that metric. I want you this because she played a tournament. Just go out and hit seventy percent. Like don't don't try to do too much. Just go out there, stay relaxed. You know, be a machine from the baseline. And she just absolutely like just smoked the girl like one and two. Like it, and it was a tough match, but she said it was so easy because of that advice, you know, is that going to work for everybody? I don't know, but 
I think it, you have a tendency to relax. You play within yourself. You're not overhitting. You're not making as many mistakes. And it could be, you know, it could be a good opportunity for somebody. So interesting. Now, I do think there's a time in training to try to raise your limits, right? You know, like yes. if, if, your top, if your best ball is 80 miles an hour, you know, maybe it's worthwhile to move, you know, to work hard to try to move your best ball up to 90 miles an hour. So now when you go 70% of 90, that's 70% of 90 is better than 70% of 80. And you right. slowly as you're older and more mature, the more you play. But, but to do that, it does take playing a couple of times a week. You know, for the people who play once on the weekend, you know, that's probably not, you know, they're probably not going to hit that big that often, be consistent. And, yeah. uh, you know, for the juniors, though, they're hitting two, three times a week. I think if they'll develop those muscular pa- you know, patterns, you know, I mean, I don't know what they're calling it today, but they used to call it muscle memory. And, but, if, you know, develop, develop those patterns for the body to, to go through and how to handle the ball. And, and, you know, I think that's one of the things we offer with what we sometimes refer to as the two forehands, you know, is that there's basically two different patterns that you have to master. Uh, and, you know, when you're the drive pattern, the forehand, you know, the power fade, drive pattern versus the lift and spin pattern. And I think that's one of the big challenges. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for a lot of coaches to implement this is to realize that it's, it's a challenge, but it's very doable. And in fact, I think the, uh, the alternative, you know, you ever heard the thing where uh, I guess it was Einstein said, do it as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> if you just work one forehand, You've made it simple, but you've made it too simple. You know, right. you don't have to lift and spin and the drive. You know, you've got a hole in your game. You know, you've made it simpler than it really can function well. You know, so I think that as simple as possible is breaking it down to two shots, you know, where you understand the lift and spin type stroke and you have that developed, where it, you have the, the drive stroke developed. And uh, if you have the, both of those patterns very well developed, it can be very consistent with them if you're using yeah. it at the right times. And to supplement what you uh, just pointed out, you know, um, when that gig data came out, you know, measuring, you know, Madison Keys hits harder than any man, for example, you know, on the, on the forehand and the backhand at certain times. And, uh, of course, there's a difference in balls between the WTA and ATP. One of the things I studied there was, Look at who the world champion has been on the women's tour. I mean, we've had the number one players, Wozniacki, and look at the players who are consistent. Rowanska just retired. You know, she was number two, three, and four, top five for almost 10 years. No weapons. Wozniacki, number one, no weapons. Halep. What weapon does Halep have? So there's a thing called natural power, you know, that I think develops naturally. And, you know, we've coached players. We took one girl just got a scholarship who, you know, she didn't have time. She was 17, came to us as a 3.5 player, you know, basically. And in one year, won a college scholarship, but she had to do it with guile, with shortened backswings, with a redirect game. Because, you know, in congruent tennis, we teach a whole, not just the two forehands that he mentioned, but, you know, we teach an entire redirect game, which is different than the current paradigm of a high-level tennis. But, you know, she just basically said, I'm going to take every ball on the rise because I'm two, I weigh 105 pounds. I'm 17 years old. I don't have time to train to win a college scholarship over four years. And you know what? She did it. Hmm. You know, it was a style choice. So, but, and she had to use her natural game and more guile and feel than anything else, you know, and intelligence, knowing that she at 105 pounds, five foot one, she was never going to be a big power player. We've got a few minutes. Uh, let's just get back to this power fade, the two forehands, because I'm, I'm fascinated by them. The power fade, are you hitting that more from in, like the baseline in? Is that shot? Tell, share with the group or the audience, like the power fade. What are the character, characteristics of that shot and how can it benefit the player? Well, the, the purest power fade would be a ball that you're probably hitting inside once you've moved up into the court. Once you've step, been able to step inside the baseline 
and generally, you know, taking the ball either on the rise or at the apex of the bounce. And that should be higher than the net because basically what you're going to do on that pure drive, uh, power drive is you're going to just drive it pretty flat. And I believe that is the original intent of when people talk about a flat shot. I believe that historically that was the, uh, I think that that was the uh, intent. And John speaks to this in his book is it wasn't about no spin might be less spin, but even that is a matter of uh, interpretation to a certain extent. But the power drive is a very flat trajectory shot where you just hit pretty directly out from your contact point. Now you can still drive the ball a little less, you know, it still can be aggressive, but maybe, you know, we, we have some variations off the power fade where we consider the shape fade. Um, where, you know, like if you're back in the rally area behind the baseline and you get a ball that's on the higher side and maybe it's rising or apexing and you could still drive the ball, but because we're back in the rally area behind the baseline, yeah, we want to be aggressive with it, but uh, we wouldn't be as aggressive as we would with what I would consider a pure all-out power fade, you know. Yeah, Sanga and Bernard Tomic were great examples of the power fade and and I uh, remember when you were working with Clay Thompson and we were talking about Tomic's feather fade. Right. And Clay said, they took that shot away from me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they used to have that shot. And of course, then they said, well, you, you know, you don't want to hit that at the pro level. And yet look what Tomic did with it. Number 17 in the world as a, as a teenager. Yeah. You know, right. So what we really try to design the, you know, the design the system around having the fade is on one side of the ball. You know, it's like, it's sort of like the difference between a curveball and a screwball. And baseball, for people who know that, are in golf, they have a fade and a draw. And so that's it's the same kind of thing. Do you want the ball to break left or break right um, based on – because you gain control of the ball by working off the edges of the ball. And if you try to square up on the ball, it's like my son who played uh, college tennis. He, he said, well, Dad, what I love about this is when you try to square up on the ball, you basically never do it that great. So you don't, but the problem is, is you don't know which side your error is going to be on. You don't know if you're going to be working off the inside or the outside when you're squaring up or attempting to square up. He said the nice thing about hitting a fade or a draw is you've already decided which side you're going to work off of. And so now you can account for that in your, your shot selection and your stroke and your shape of shots. It sort of relates to what I always said about the serve is, you know, people talk about a flat serve or this, that, and the other. And, and I always say, hey, look, you're going to get some spin on your serve. So if you're going to get spin, you need to know what spin you're going to get because you need to account for it. So, you know, when I was working with your son Gianni, I said, look, you need to know, you need to have intent for your spin. You need to be creating spin. You need to know whether you're going to get a lot or a little. And all that needs to be, you know, baked in to the equation because you can't just square up on the ball and get what you get. I mean, if you can do that, but you, that's why you see people out there serving 15, 20, 25% per serve is because they're not accounting for all these variables. Yeah. You know? And Serena is not above moving to a Eastern grip on her serve and then going ahead and just trying to bash it kind of flat through the court, but it's more of a change of pace than anything. So, you know, when you go to the draw, you know how your ball is going to act, how it's going to act, react, and fly. You go to a fade, you know how it's going to do. And you know, the other thing you know is what it's really good for. You know, like fades are good for more driving the ball through the court, whereas the draws are more for lifting and spinning and and uh, making the ball kick. You know, like if you, you can take in the rally area, take a dropping ball and you know, you know how effective a kick serve can be sometimes, especially if you have a really good kick. Well, just imagine if you're back there in the rally area and now all of a sudden you can hit a, what is essentially a kick serve with a big heavy lift and spin draw. You can hit that big ball, but now you're not restricted to a box. you got the whole court to use. Yeah. So might have more action than kick serve. So, you, good. And so that's why, you know, I really like uh, knowing when and how to use those different shapes as appropriate to your situation got it that was awesome you guys thank you so much where can people again where can they they if they need to get a hold of you if you guys are in the atlanta area or you just where do they 
Congruent Tennis, correct? www.congruenttennis.com is the website. We got congruenttennis.com. A lot of people can come in there and read articles. We have a little bit of video. We're trying to expand our video library. You know, in fact, we've got a couple of your top spin tennis videos on there, and we look look to look to link to more of those. And then we also have what we call the Advanced Tennis Foundation Facebook page. Use that to link to our other site quite a bit, but we also share a variety of other. We have uh, top spin tennis stuff on there. We have uh, Jack Brody with Brody Board and Brody Brody Tennis. People are familiar with him. Um, we also have Steve Kaplan. We met with him in New York. Up there at a Beth Page, very, very knowledgeable guy. We've got a guy on the opposite coast over there, Grant Grinnell. But we literally have thousands of members, and a lot of them are coaches from all levels. You know, every, yeah, you guys, you guys just hit 3,000 members. Congratulations as of this video. So that's that's fantastic. Uh, people are starting to take notice. They're um, yeah, You're seeing the power of uh, of this model and the community, I'll right? The gatekeepers, the USTA yep. will take notice. Yep, you guys well, are that, you're open. You're open to thoughts. You know that your model. I mean, there could be some things, right? I mean, for the most part, it ties in a lot. But you're open to suggestions, which I love. We I absolutely it. love. We encourage it. We ask for it. Um, I think. Um, you know, that's, that's the good side of not being happy with everything you see from the USDA is we've been able to learn what we feel like learn from their mistakes. Uh, you know, we try to really uh, we try to put out some new info and show how our system can help players. But at the same time, we're not trying to set ourselves up, set ourselves up as gatekeepers to uh, say, oh, you have to do it our way or the highway kind of thing. But we try to be very inclusive of, because, uh, you know, tennis is a little bit like a buffet, you know, I mean, somebody might watch something you're doing different than us. And it might be the thing that takes their game up that year, <laughs> but they may next year, <coughs> next year, they may come back and go, okay, that did help me a lot last year, but now it's got me to a level where I see what congruent Dennis was saying. And that might be the next step on the ladder call or vice versa, you know? Right. All right. All right. Good stuff. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time. This has been awesome. I, I totally like imagine this podcast. I totally could see somebody like commuting. They're on the road. They're, they're geeking out over tennis. They get to listen to you two, you know, speak about tennis. So um, I just really appreciate your time. Thanks for all your uh, expertise and look forward to doing this again. Well, we really enjoy being a part of it and we enjoy working with, with you and coaches like you around the country. Thank you so much. Okay. Nice to talk with you.